Good afternoon, everyone. It's really an honor to welcome you to the Mary Interlandy Memorial Lecture um, and to welcome our guests from warmer climes, and we hope a promise for us of better weather in springtime. <laughs> um, you have come on the verge of another blizzard, New England style. Um, and as I thought about this moment, we do and we have had the custom as we have welcomed renowned scholars, how we'll do a much better job than I would of your introduction. But we have wanted to say at the beginning of this lecture how incredibly grateful we are to the Interlandy family um, that the tragedy of the death of their daughter led them to this generative gift to Brown. Um, and it is truly at the heart of much that's spiritual um, when great loss leads people to great learning. I was thinking about Mary and her family who always write a very lively letter at Christmas um, telling us about various things and usually in quite an irreverent, funny tone. This year's piece included why if the three wise men had been three wise women, um, life would have turned out differently in Christianity. Some of you may know that wisdom. I won't repeat it. Um, but it made me think of a piece of Mary Oliver's um, that I thought perhaps for this afternoon that promises spring and yet takes it away with the other hand might be the right um, way to begin our thoughts of Mary and our gratitude for her family's generosity. This is from a piece called A Morning Modern Psalm. And the poet writes, it doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Our prayers for Mary's family and their continuing grief and their continuing generosity to us are always the proper beginning for this lecture, but we are eager for another voice to speak and we come with attention, so thank you. Good uh, early evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to, are we on Daylight Savings Time now, or yeah. we're off it? Like, I never no, can. we're on it. We're on it, okay. Welcome to Daylight Savings Time. Um, <laughs> I know that there will be a, a section of you who will be showing up uh, around 6.30 for the start of the lecture. Oh, no. They already will have showed up at 4.30, no. They left already. <laughs> they left already. <laughs> um, I want to give a special uh, thank you this evening, uh, not only to all of you for coming, but uh, to our Contemplative Studies Program Manager, Ann Hireman Hart, and to Lee Calarian Kendall, the Office Manager of the Chaplain's Office, for their tireless work in making arrangements for and promoting both the lecture and yesterday's wonderful workshop on Tibetan Buddhist compassion meditation by our distinguished guests this evening. It is one of the distinctive hallmarks of these annual events that our distinguished visitors offer both a contemplative practice workshop and a lecture to our Brown community and to the larger communities in our city, our state, and our region. As many of you know, the contemplative studies program at Brown includes both our medical school scholarly concentration program and our undergraduate arts and sciences concentration, one of the newest at Brown. <clears throat> Contemplative studies is a rapidly developing and exciting new academic field in which we study a range of especially significant human experiences that over the centuries have helped many find a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives and have made and helped them make significant contributions to building a just and ethical society. These experiences are often characterized by deep levels of concentration, tranquility, and insight into the nature of self-identity and insight into the various larger contexts in which we uh, ourselves are deeply embedded. They occur on a spectrum from the spontaneous experiences of focusing in the moment and flowing with our constantly changing experience attained, for example, through artistic uh, performance and athletic activities to the most profound and deliberately cultivated experiences 
found in religious traditions, including prayer, yoga, and meditation of various kinds. One of the hallmarks of our program is that we've developed what we call an integrative contemplative pedagogy that combines traditional third-person at a distance approaches traditionally found in the academy with innovative critical first-person approaches. In these latter, students try out contemplative practices in a classroom setting with the same critical spirit through which we approach any topic in the university. They can then stand back and appraise the meaning and significance of these practices and often examine how they are applied to the important social issues of the day. It was these kinds of interests that animated the excitement that Mary Interlandy showed about contemplative studies in the early days when we were de first developing our program. And it was with these goals in mind that her family generously created this memorial lecture series to honor her ideals, her life, and her promise. We have been and we continue to be deeply in their debt. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our distinguished visitor for the 14th annual Mary Interlandy Memorial Lecture, Professor Jose Ignacio Cabazon, the 14th Dalai Lama Professor of Tibetan Buddhism and Cultural Studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Professor Cabazon was an undergraduate astrophysics major at Caltech when he first looked into the voluminous Los Angeles Yellow Pages. That was part of a phone book. Now today, Yellow Pages are these little truncated things. But back in the day, Yellow Pages were like the Britannica of like where to find different things. There was no internet. Imagine a world without an internet. The Yellow Pages was the internet. And so it was through the Yellow Pages that this young undergraduate astrophysics major at Caltech made his way to a Tibetan Buddhist meditation practice group. And he left that day with this strange idea to write a personal letter to the Dalai Lama, asking him where to go to study in India, kind of innocently expecting a reply. Nonetheless, in response, he did receive a letter directing him to a Tibetan monastic university in India where he went for a semester to study and where he showed the motivation and creativity that became the hallmarks of his later scholarly career by somehow convincing the Caltech administration to incorporate this senior semester into his Bachelor of Science degree in physics. <laughs> I'm in awe. <clears throat> he subsequently went on to do his graduate work at the University of Wisconsin in what was the nation's first and still relatively rare graduate program in Buddhist studies. And he also spent many years studying and practicing at the Sarah Monastery near Mysore in India. After receiving his PhD, Dr. Cabazon joined the wandering uh, scholars of our generation um, in teaching at a number of institutions, including Carleton College, Trinity in Hartford, Ohio State University of Colorado, and the Iliff School of Theology in Denver before arriving at the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2001, where he has remained to this day. Over the decades, Professor Cabazon has become a renowned scholar of Tibetan Buddhist theories of mind and of logic and of South Asian Buddhist attitudes and theories on human sexuality. He's published 16 books, including two written with the Dalai Lama and many more scholarly articles, and he is currently a president-elect of the American Academy of Religion. His most recently published books are The Just King, a classical Tibetan treatise on royal ethics and sexuality in classical South Asian Buddhism. His topic for tonight's lecture is Buddhist sexual ethics, the ancient textual tradition and its modern relevance. Please join me in giving a warm brown welcome to Professor Jose Cabazon. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. So I want to thank uh, Contemplative Studies at Brown, Department of Religious Studies, and especially Professor Hal Roth for the kind invitation to, to speak to you today. Um, and my topic um, is 
one that I've just finished a book on. So I'm, what I'm going to do is give you the kind of synopsis of the longest chapter, which is really the kind the issue that began the whole project. So, but and I'm going to talk about that too. In the in the early 1990s, I began to to be interested. I, I began to study uh, texts that had to do with um, with gender, with sexuality, um, and I edited this volume called Buddhism, Sexuality, and Gender, which came out in 1992. And I can't remember now whether it was that same year or shortly thereafter, I was invited to be one of the uh, participants in a workshop that was held every summer in um, this island off the coast of New Hampshire that's called Star Island. And this is a summer retreat that's held for Unitarians um, and that's run by an organization called the Institute for Religion in, the, in an Age of Science, which, among other things, publishes a journal on religion and science called Zygon. I don't know if it still exists anymore or not, but... Um, you think so? Yeah. So the year that I was invited, maybe because they saw that I had published this edited volume, it was a year on, uh, on religion, science, and sexuality. So they had experts on religion, and they also had experts on sexuality. They had um, people who had uh, done work on, um, on human sexuality, who were doctors, psychologists, and so forth. One of the participants was a woman named Helen Fisher, who um, I think is... Uh, a, either a psych psychologist, psychiatrist, or neuroscientist of some sort, and she works on human sexuality. She later became a consultant for Match.com, uh, <laughs> developing their categories to match people. Uh, and probably made more money doing that than she did at her day job. Anyway, we're all there on this little island, Star Island, in this big old hotel. And um, I realized that this topic was really interesting and that it was more than just passing interest that, that brought about the existence of this little edited volume. And from that time, I really started thinking that I should do a broader book on, on sexuality, on Buddhism and sexuality. So at this point, you know, ever since the meeting at Star Island, I had been kind of thinking about, well, I really should get my act together and write this second book on Buddhism and sexuality. And after this meeting, in, which took place in 1997, then I decided that I, I really should do that. And then I spent the next 20 years uh, writing this book, Sexuality in Classical South Asian Buddhism, which looks at kind of and compiles all of the relevant material that has to do with sexuality, not only sexual ethics, but I realized that in order to understand sexual ethics, that one needed to really look at a, a lot of other material. So the, the book treats uh, texts that are written in three languages, in Pali and Sanskrit, which are two ancient Indian languages, and then the translations of texts into Tibetan, which no longer exist in Pali and Sanskrit, some of which no longer exist in Pali and Sanskrit. And I looked at not only the religious literature, but also there's a lot of very interesting and important material that's written in uh, the ancient Indian medical texts and in the, in the legal texts called Dharm, Dharma Shastra, and in the erotic literature, the most famous example, which is the Kama Sutra, but the, that, that's really just one example of a broader literature called Kama Shastra in India. And uh, the last chapter of the book you'll see is, has to do with sexual ethics. But to get there, I realized that I really needed to explain a lot of the presuppositions uh, of Buddhism. And that included doctrines of cosmology. I mean, what, what Buddhism had to say about um, how human beings come into existence at the beginning of a world cycle. These are the myths, the cosmogonic myths the myths of creation, and uh, how human beings therefore become embodied, how they become sexually differentiated, how different beings in different uh, portions of the 
um, of the universe um, engage in sexual, in sexual acts, how they experience sexual pleasure. Um, so I mean, the human world is one small piece of the larger Buddhist, uh, of the larger cosmos that Buddhists, Buddhists presume. And that's kind of what that chapter uh, deals with. And probably the most important psychological aspect of the, the discussion of sexuality has to do with desire. Um, the Buddhist texts don't actually develop a, th a specific theory of sexual desire, but um, I try to piece this together from the general theory of desire and from um, discussions of what um, of, of what uh, sex actually is. So I think you you can kind of piece together what constitutes sexual desire. And since the community that wrote these texts were celibate monks, they were concerned with the control of desire, which means that they developed certain antidotes, what they called antidotes, uh, in order to be able to control desire and therefore to be able to safeguard their celibacy. So, um, that constitutes several chapters of the book. Then there's a chapter on gender and biological sex, a chap chapter on nor non-normative se uh, sexualities in which I talk about the different genders that exist in Buddhism and um, the categorization of normative and non-normative genders as of cl two classes of beings that are called pandakas and shandas that I translate loosely as uh, queer. But basically, these are non-normative uh, uh, genders um, in, that, are, that are characterized in great detail and, uh, in the texts. And then finally, the chapter on sexual ethics. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is that, that specific theme, the theme that comes out of the meeting with the Dalai Lama. But before we do that, I think it's necessary for you to understand something about the Buddhist uh, theory of desire and its antidotes. Because it's really desire that undergirds uh, m most of this discussion and is considered the kind of psychological motivating force underlying sexuality. So, so desire, according to these texts, <coughs> and I'm making this lecture very general because oftentimes I find that if I give names of texts that for the most part, people don't, it, it's meaningless to people. So I'm just going to kind of talk about this as if it were a generic body of works, but in fact, these are all specific texts that I'm, I'm uh, looking at uh, throughout the book. So the theory of desire is that, this, first, first of all, that desire is a mental state, uh, which is important because it means that it is not reducible to the body. There are actual Buddhist thinkers that we find records in the Buddhist texts of um, Buddhist thinkers engaging in dialogue with uh, Indian medical tradition. And for example, uh, in the works of one uh, philosopher whose name is a Buddhist philosopher whose name was Dharmakirti, um, we find him being challenged by a doctor who says, you claim that desire is a mental state, but really the body has a lot to do with whether or not we uh, experience desire. Isn't that the case? And Dharmakirti says, nope, it's only mental. And, and then the doctor says, well, what about, isn't it the case that when people overeat that they tend to experience more desire? And Dharmakirti says, no, it doesn't follow. He says, you know, it's only mental. He says, what about, uh, and then the doctor says, what about uh, men who haven't had sex in a long time and have accumulated a lot of semen? Isn't it the case that these people tend to experience more desire? And Dharma Gurdjie says, no. So he basically refuses any attempt to, um, to reduce sex to even, I mean, at, at, at a certain point, I think he says that there can be physical uh, conditions that can attenuate or that can increase or de decrease sex, but for the most part he wants to say that it's really all uh, uh, a, qu a question of mind. Um, 
Desire is intentional, which means that, in this case, it means that it has an object. That is, we always have desire for something. It may be possible, we, we might think that it's possible to kind of experience a contentless desire, just kind of desire in general, like, I'm hungry, but I really don't know what I want to eat type of thing. But um, for the most part, we, we have desire for something, like f for food. Um, so there's a lot to be said about this, but we, we don't have much time, so I'm going to go on. So, f but, so desire always has an object. In the case of sexuality, that object tends to be um, another person's body. Um, but there are many examples in the Buddhist text where it's not a body, but sometimes a body part that is the object of someone's sexual desire. And there are even cases where uh, a person becomes romantically attached to or begins to desire a, um, someone else's personality. But that's rare. For the most part, when the texts talk about sexual desire, they're talking about desire for uh, someone else's body and specifically for the experience of, uh, for experiencing desire for experiencing pleasure um, in regard to uh, an, an object which is someone else's body. So it's intentional. It's based on past mental predispositions or seeds. So the Buddhist theory is that when we are born, we are born with all of these latent predispositions uh, that are in the form of mental seeds that exist in the mind. Sometimes in, in some forms of Buddhism, these are said to exist in a kind of storehouse, sp special type of consciousness that's called the storehouse consciousness that is the receptacle of all of these seeds. And these seeds are kind of what make us who we are. They, they represent c certain kinds of uh, predispositions, habits, tendencies that we have. Um, and were we not to have the seeds of desire already in our minds, then we would not experience desire again. So um, it's necessary, for desire to be born, it's necessary that these exist in the form of seeds in the mind. And then a desire is triggered by some kind of pleasurable, ple pleasurable sense experience. In the case of uh, sexual desire, it could be uh, triggered by the experience of uh, a beautiful body or some other sense experience like um, a beautiful smell or there, the texts also talk about monks being titillated by the sound of women's bangles clinging. So, so it can be really, any, anything can kind of trigger this. It's strange that the texts don't and I think this is a limitation of the theory because in the end, I think the Buddhist theory of desire is a kind of stimulus response theory. That there's some trigger, some sense trigger that's necessary in order to make desire uh, start. But you don't see texts talking about people kind of desiring out of the blue, right? So just kind of thinking of something and, and experiencing desire, especially sexual desire. So it always involves some kind of sense stimulus. The nature of desire, the actual nature of desire, is that it is a form of attachment to a pleasurable sensation and a refusal to let that go. Um, at this point, the texts often talk about, uh, use various metaphors, um, like um, there's a certain sap that grew out of a tree that was called monkey lime. And apparently it's a very strong type of glue. And it says, desire is like that. It's like that glue, right? Once you get it on you, it's impossible to get rid of it. And importantly, desire is said to be addictive. And because all human beings have uh, experience pleasure from the senses, therefore the senses are themselves addictive. So in a sense, we are all uh, sen sense addicts. Um, this isn't to say that that there isn't a range of a range of addictive behavior, but um, 
everyone is addicted to the pleasures of the senses, and since uh, sexual pleasure is said to be, the that is orgasm, is said to be the greatest pleasure that's achievable by human beings, there's a debate in the text as to whether food or orgasm is uh, <laughs> the, the greatest pleasure, but it's, it's orgasm th that wins in the end. So, of course, the greater the pleasure, uh, the greater the desire, the, the greater the attachment, and therefore the more addictive it is. So, um, all, but all pleasure is like this. And so it's because of this, because of the fact that it is, um, to use the technical term, a klesha, or um, a, um, I don't know how, how is klesha translated nowadays? It, it used to be translated negative emotion, but, uh, say again? Affliction, affliction, that's good. Affliction. Um, so it's a mental affliction uh, because it stymies, it acts as an impediment to the spiritual life uh, insofar as um, it, it uh, represents a lack of freedom, right? If you're stuck in this addictive cycle of experiencing pleasure, wanting more, which causes you to, to, to want more, uh, and, and this is kind of cyclical uh, pattern, then uh, this is going to be kind of impediment to freedom. And this is, uh, there is a long Buddhist explanation of how this works. Um, it's elaborated in the theory that's called the 12 links of dependent arising. This is kind of the simple version. You begin with a mind that's, that's already predisposed to desire, right? That has the seeds of desire, that's necessary. The reason that this is necessary is because there are said to be some individuals, those who have cultivated the spiritual path and who have become non-desirous, who have gotten rid of desirous, uh, desires, who no longer have those seeds. And when their minds come into contact with pleasurable, with beautiful things, right, with pleasurable sensations, they don't experience desire. So. This is why this precondition is there, that minds have to be predisposed to experiencing desire. Those seeds have to be there. When, this, when those seeds are there, and the mind comes into contact with a pleasant object, then the first thing it does is, is to make that object seem real. So this is a necessary step, because unless the object becomes real, um, unless the object is experienced as real, then there's not enough stuff there to work with in the subsequent steps. So this is said to be a precondition. I'm, I'm talking about a mental precondition to the experience of desire. So the first thing the mind does is to make the object seem real. The next thing it does is to exaggerate the qualities of the object, which means to only see the beautiful, pleasant, nice side of it and to kind of downplay the negative uh, or unpleasant side of the object. So to exaggerate the object's good qualities. Um, until finally the mind then is um, driven through this process to want to possess the object. I mean, it focuses on it and wants to possess it until finally when it gets it, it refuses it to let it go. And that's the actual nature of desire. So you can imagine how this works in the case of Sexuality, right? So this is not developed specifically in regard to sexuality, but you can imag imagine that um, a person who is uh, who has the seeds of sexual desire in their m in their mental continuum in their minds it comes into contact with a beautiful body, and the the mind kind of thinks, boy, this is really beautiful, right? And then exaggerates the beauty of the object, downplays any uh, negative aspects of it, and then desires it. So the, the basic theory is that this is a cyclical process, right? So every act of desire, every time that the mind experiences desire, seeds are planted in the mind. That act of desire leaves in its wake a certain kind of seed or d predisposition that then leads to a future uh, instance of desire. And 
when that desire is experienced again in the future, that leaves its own seeds, which then cause desire to be experienced again. And this process is endless. The endlessness of the process is depicted in Tibetan art. In uh, Actually, this tradition goes back to, to India. In India, it was called the Bhava Chakra, which means the wheel of existence. But in nowadays, people call it the wheel of life. This is a depiction that shows exactly this process, this endless process, cyclical process of acts leading to uh, men mental seeds being planted within the mind, which cause uh, this process to be repeated again, not only in one life, but at the end of life with a mind that has all of these seeds planted within it, it causes that mind to be reborn, and this is the this is what reincarnation is, right? So Buddhism, like most Indian religions, believes in reincarnation. And this is what drives reincarnation, is precisely this. It's the fact that you have minds that are conditioned by these acts that at the end of life cause the mind to be, uh, to be reborn. And that's what you see represented on the right side, which is a uh, enlargement of the central hub of the wheel you see people either going down into lower realms of existence or sometimes going up into the higher realms of existence, uh, all the time driven by the th three central poisons, what are, what are known as the three poisons, which are represented here by three animals, uh, the pig, the chicken, and the snake. Um, and as you can imagine, um, desire is... Um, one of these, and it's represented by the pig, I think. The, 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 the chicken represents ignorance, the snake represents hatred, and the pig represents desire. So for Buddhists, for traditional Buddhists, um, desire is a problem for many reasons, but it's a problem because it is one of the drivers of reincarnation. And reincarnation is not a good thing in Buddhism. Right? Reincarnation is what you want to be able to control, and yet for most people it is uncontrollable because it's driven by these negative emotions that cause us to accumulate karma, which at the end of our lives throws us involuntarily into the next rebirth. So desire is a problem. So the question is, what can we do about it? So the tradition says, there's not much you can do about a mind that's filled with all these seeds that are ready to pop into desires. Right? There's not much you can do about that. That's what you come to life with. Right? So, but there, is, there are ways to control desire later in this process. And it, specifically, if you can control the second, third, or fourth steps you can still thwart the arising of desire, or in fact, any affliction, any afflicted state of mind. It's possible to thwart it, stop it, so that it doesn't arise. Um, by intervening at the second, third, or fourth steps. So if you can stop, for example, the mind coming into contact with a pleasant object, then you can stop desire from arising. Or if you can stop the mind from reifying the object, from creating this initial real looking object, then it, you can also stop it. Or if you can stop the mind from exaggerating the object. So as a result of this, the tradition elaborates various antidotes to suppress. And I'm not sure that the word suppress is the right word here because it has all these Freudian overtones. But, um, to temporarily eliminate, let's call it that way, uh, sexual desire. So one of these is ethical restraint. And in the Buddhist tradition, this takes two forms. Celibacy, which is practiced by monks and nuns, and this, the forms of sexual restraint that are practiced by lay people. In addition to that, um, the... Um, Second and third 
um, steps in the, in the causal process that leads to desire. There are techniques for addressing that in the form of meditations on the incest taboo. So for example, there's a, uh, there's a passage in which the Buddha says, monks, whenever you come into contact with a woman who's the same age as you, think of her as your sister. Whenever you come in contact with a woman who is old enough to be your mother, think of her as your mother. Here, I mean, there's obviously some kind of an incest taboo where he's saying, think of her as someone that you would not want to have sex with, right? Because it would be, it would, because it would be considered incest. So he teaches monks to, to kind of cultivate these attitudes to, to lessen desire. Or there's also equanimity meditation. Um, the... If we think about it, desire f for someone uh, requires us to single out that person and give that person a special attention that they w wouldn't ordinarily have. If you cultivate an attitude where you see everyone, where you consider everyone equally without anyone being special, then it's impossible for desire to arise. Um, there's also forms of antidotes to desire based on the practice of mental concentration. So uh, very concentrated levels of mind uh, that focus on an object uh, and cultivate very deep levels of concentration are also ha said to have the ability to temporarily eliminate desire. Uh, but the most famous Buddhist meditation on desire is called the meditation on the foulness of the human body. In Pali, this was called a subha. Uh, bhavanam is, means meditation. Asubha means un, impure, unclean, foul. So the idea is, uh, remember that this, th this fourth step about exaggerating the object's good qualities, that see, see the object as being beautiful. Uh, here th the purpose is to do the, exactly the opposite, to see the object, what the text says, in its true form, right? rather than just concentrating on the kind of outer level of the human body to kind of really see the body in its true reality. And the way that monks did this in, in this form of meditation called meditation on foulness was to go to uh, charnel grounds, the place where bodies were dumped. Um, and uh, the Buddha said, uh, told monks and nuns, actually, to uh, look at decomposing corpses and to see what happened to them over time. And that this would generate in them a feeling of the true nature of the human body, what the human body was like. So, in contemporary terms, I mean, we have this kind of cult of the body where we think bodies are beautiful and... Um, you know, we should take care of the body and everything that is associated with the body is, is great. This is the exact opposite of that, right? It's the idea of the true nature of the body is foul. And all you have to do is wait, the, just let time take its, uh, its course. And if you just look at the corpse, it will show you the true nature of what the human body is like. This meditation is said to have worked very effectively. Uh, monks would do this. They'd go to Charnal and nuns. And the, the Buddha, interestingly, said, you should, assuming a kind of uh, heterosexual orientation, he said, monks should only look at the bodies of, uh, of males, of other men. Because even the, the, uh, a newly dead female corpse might be enough to generate sexual attraction. And the same thing for women. He told women that they should only concentrate on the corpses of newly deceased women. Um, but whatever the case, I mean, the, they um, internalized this idea of the impurity or foulness of the human body and became so disgusted um, that at, at this point the Buddha had, was actually in retreat and he set the monks to doing this form of meditation the monks started committing suicide. And there was a spate of suicides within the Buddhist community. In other words, they saw not only the, the external corpses, but actually 
their own bodies as being disgusting, and they became so disgusted with, it, with their own bodies that they could not, no longer inhabit their bodies and they started committing suicide. And in the case, some monks couldn't actually bring themselves to kill themselves, so they would pay uh, other people to kill them. Uh, so it said that the Buddha came out of this, came out of retreat, and he said, he noticed that there were fewer monks than when he had been gone <laughs> into retreat. And he asked, why are there fewer monks? And they said, well, you know, this is what happened. You taught them fallenness meditation. And they started offing themselves, you know. So the Buddha, at this point, the Buddha said, I need to teach a kinder, gentler form of meditation. And do you know what he taught at that point? He taught mindfulness. This is said to be the origin of mindfulness meditation, is the form of meditation. That, I mean, this, I think it's in the, the Tibetan Vinaya texts that tell this story. But I can't remember. It could be in one of the Pali texts. I have the reference in my book. So, so this is where, the, the, where mindfulness, the first time that the Buddha taught mindfulness meditation. He, said, he taught a form of meditation that was not as severe as this. But he never, the Buddha never um, repudiated this form of meditation. He never said, just forget about this. This was a bad experiment, right? And in fact, this form of meditation is practiced to this day. And if you want to read a really good account of a monk who made this form of meditation his basically the basis of his practice, and is said to have attained arhatship, that is the highest, is said to have attained nirvana. His name is uh, Mahabua, uh, M-A-H-A-B-U-A. Do you know what that book is called? It's something about, I can't remember what the title is now. Something about like steps, uh, path to, Maybe. I think, I think it's got a simpler title. Uh, somebody can, you can look it up on Amazon, and then if you read all the titles to me, I'll, I'll tell you which one it is. But it's a really interesting book. If you want to get a sense of a person who actually practiced this traditional form of meditation and is said to have reached very high levels of insight as a result of it. So this is a form of fallen. So this was one of the ways of I intervening in the process of desire in order to thwart it from, you know, to stop it, to, to thwart it, to stop it from arising. Okay. But the one that we're going to talk about, <laughs> and the lecture is already half over, is actually another uh, uh, way of, of temporary, uh, dealing with desire, and that's eth ethical restraint. An ethical restraint was practiced differently by two monastic communities, right? So there was the form of ethical restraint that was practiced by the ordained clergy, that is monks and nuns, and then the form that was practiced by lay people. The monastic community, nuns called bhikshunis or monks called bhikshu, um, are, so monks and nuns are ordained. They take ordination in a kind of special ceremony that involves many different senses. In fact, one of the things that I argue in the book is that um, the, the fact that, this is, that, that they take uh, vows in the context of a public ceremony that involves all these different components is actually one of the things that gives monasticism its power. Um, but they're ordained, they make a commitment to 200 plus rules of conduct or vows. Um, among these is a vow of celibacy. And all of the rules of, the, of monks and nuns are laid out in this uh, literature called the Vinaya. Central to this, as I said, is the vow of celibacy. So um, there, there are actually four major vows, not lying, not killing, not stealing, and not having sex. These are the four principal vows of monks and nuns. If they break any one of these vows, they automatically cease. Th they, their, their ordination has, been, has deteriorated, and they are supposed to be expelled from the community. But whether or not they're caught and expelled, they kind of stop being monks at that point, or nuns. But the vow of celibacy is especially 
actually all of these vows are explained in very great detail. Why? Because monastic, because the, these communities had to figure out what constituted a breaking of the vow, right? So in the Vinaya, there are all these stories about monks and nuns engaging in various acts and then coming, you know, another, another monk or nun coming to the Buddha and said, that monk or nun did such a thing. Is that the breaking of the vow of celibacy or is it, isn't it? And the Buddha would say, yes, it is or no, it isn't. So there's one funny story, for example, in which uh, a monk has a pet female monkey and uh, another group of monks come uh, to this monk's hermitage and uh, they find out that the monk has been having sex with his pet monkey and the um, and the and the monk says well I know we weren't supposed to have sex with other people but I I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to have sex with monkey you know <laughs> so the monks, the, the monks scratch their head and they go, well, maybe let's ask the Buddha and see what the Buddha says. You know? And the Buddha says, no, you're not allowed to have sex with animals either. Right? So in this way, through a variety of different cases that are described in the Vinaya, and we don't really know whether these are historically accurate or not, um, but the vow gets described in very great detail. So... The way that it's described in the case of the monks' rules is different than the way that it's described in the case of nuns' rules. So that's why I say that the, that the, the vow of celibacy is gendered. It's different for men than it is for women. For men, it, is, it, it consists of a penile penetration of any orifice of any being. Right? So it can be man, woman, or third gender individual. It's known as pandaka. Um, and it, it can be broken by uh, the penetration of the mouth, anus, or vagina of a man, woman, or pandaka. Uh, it even goes to the extent of saying how much penetration. So it says, to the depth of a sesame seed. Uh, this is what constitutes the breaking of the vow of celibacy. So it goes down to this level of, uh, of explanation because, as I said, Monks and nuns were really uh, concerned with d defining exactly what constituted the breaking of this vow. The same is true for all the other vows, right? So it's not only for sexuality, but also how much and under what conditions would something constitute stealing, for example, or what actually constitutes a lie. There's an equal level of detail for all of these uh, vows. For women, um, it's in a sense, the converse, being penetrated, but it turns out that women also break their vow of celibacy if they enjoy the sexual advances or if they flirt with a man and, um, um, or if they enjo enjoy when a man fondles them. So there's a lot that we could say about these things, but we, we want to actually move on because um, we want to get to the not, not to the monastic vow, but to the, the vows of the lay community. So lay men are, are called upasakas and lay women. Um, they also take a series of five uh, vows, or they follow five precepts. Um, they are not celibate. That is, they're allowed to have sex, but they commit to avoiding something called sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct. So really, Buddhist sexual ethics consists of the elaboration of the doctrine of sexual misconduct. So this is, this is what the last portion of my book deals with, is sexual ethics as uh, um, se sexual mi misconduct. On Buddhism, in these texts, in the Indian and Tibetan texts, there are said to be two types of evil. Natural moral evil... These are non-virtuous acts that are non-virtue uh, for everyone, regardless of, uh, of who they are. Um, and then there are specific acts that are, that are violations of um, specific vows that people take. Um, drinking alcohol is said not to be a natural evil, an inherent evil, but rather... A, um, uh, a, 
an act that, an evil that is only a breaking of the precept uh, of a Buddhist who takes such a vow to begin with. Um, there's a famous story of a monk, the woman, the goat, and the beer. And a monk, this is supposed to illustrate why alcohol is not great, but still not a moral evil. Um, monk meets a woman on the road. The woman says, look, I really like you. You either have sex with me or you kill the goat or you drink the beer. And the monk thinks to himself, if I have sex with the woman, then I stop being a monk because I, I've broken my vow of celibacy. Um, if I kill the goat, that's not a good thing. This is a living being. So the, the least bad of the three things, right, the lesser evil, is to drink the beer. So he drinks the beer and then he ends up having sex with the woman and roasting the goat anyway. <laughs> so the, the, the idea here is uh, that alcohol may not be an intrinsic evil, but it's not a good idea. And that's why Buddhists avo avoid it. So what, what, what about sex? Is sex an intrinsic moral evil or not? Um, sex is problematic. It, it is pleasurable. In fact, it's the greatest source of pleasure. It, 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 it is addictive because the greater the pleasure, the greater the desire to re-experience that pleasure, according to the Buddhist psychological theory. Uh, but it's not considered, sex is not in, considered intrinsically evil. However, certain forms of sex are considered evil. And these forms are called sexual misconduct. And sexual misconduct is fi found under both natural evil and under the breaking of specific vows. So sexual misconduct has a history. And the important thing to note is that um, there's an early version of the doctrine of sexual misconduct and a later version. The earlier version says, says uh, that, that runs from the, fifth, from the origin of Buddhism up to the third century CE, says, you know what? The form of sexual misconduct that Buddhists must refrain from is simply adultery. Adultery. After the third century, then you begin to see another form of sexual misconduct, which is the one that we find that we find in works like Tsongkhapa's, which is a kind of micromanagement of lay sexuality. So the question is, and then so for, what I want to do is just show you what these three things are briefly, tell you why this occurs in the third century, and then conclude by uh, looking at some questions uh, that Buddhists face today. So the earliest doctrine, as I said, is um, really constructed around um, um, I improper partners. So sex with another man's wife, sex with a so-called protected woman. Then some texts say, well, ideally, Buddhist men should not have sex with prostitutes. They really should kind of stick to their own wife or wives, since me men tended to have more than one wife, at least if they were of a certain economic class. Um, and I'm not going to read you the text, but you'll have to trust me that this is what the earliest texts say. Who are the protected women that men are not, Buddhist men are not supposed to have sex with? They're un women who are underage, who are under the guardianship of parents, siblings, or relatives, or a clan. Women who are protected by their religion, that is nuns, protected by their husbands, that is married women. Um, legally protected, uh, it basically means female prisoners. Female prisoners are not allowed as sexual partners for Buddhist men and women who are betrothed or engaged. Who is unprotected? That is, who's left? Who could men have, uh, sex, Buddhist men have sex with? And these, these are the categories. Uh, spinsters, I mean, I'm using the terms that are used in the text themselves, right? Um, the, the various categories are called used women, that is, women who are no longer virgins. These include widows, women who have been abandoned by their husbands, victims of rape, um, men are also allowed to have sex with prostitutes, with their own female slaves, with ex-nuns. Um, so sex with any of these women was considered permissible and did not constitute sexual misconduct, even if the man is married. So 
in ancient India, it was presumed that men would not be monogamous, is basically what it comes down to. The greatest source of men's sexual desire and interest in the ancient text is courtesans and prostitutes. Um, courtesans were oftentimes extremely well educated uh, in the classics and in the arts. Uh, they oftentimes charged vast sums of money um, that, and contributed a large portion of their salary since they paid taxes, went into state coffers, and an important source of income for, the, for governments. Okay. Um, what constitutes sexual ethical norms, what, what constitutes sexual ethics for women is never mentioned in these texts. So women are not portrayed as moral agents. The texts never say, women, now you are not allowed to do such and such a thing. Women are not addressed at all in these texts. But I think that nonetheless, there certain norms are presumed. One is that women should be celibate until the time that they're married. Uh, the ideal of virginal purity at the time of marriage is considered, was important back then, just as it is today in, in many traditional cultures. And the, f the fidelity of women after marriage, mostly for the purpose of being able to ensure the paternity, right? To make sure that the child is the child of the husband. The only way to really ensure that in in, the, in, in ancient times, and when they don't, didn't have DNA tests, was through um, making sure that the wife, wife was faithful. As I mentioned before, sex between women is not considered sex and is not regulated at all in these texts, which tells you something about um, the, the kind of androcentric and phallocentric, if we want to use that term, um, presupposition of this literature. After the third century, you get the list of partners begins to expand. So it includes now, not only are, are protected women not allowed, but also it says men should not have sex with other men. That is, we see it for the first time actually in the fourth century. Um, homosexuality is, is introduced and prohibited from this time on. Uh, it says men are not allowed to have sex with their male slaves. Um, and men are not allowed to have uh, sex with female prostitutes who are under contract with other men. So um, in a very late text, 10th century, it also says that women, of a women who are not of the same class or status are also prohibited sexual partners. But it's not only partners. It's also improper places. It says men are, Buddhists should not have sex near religious sites, near temples or stupas or in the house of their teachers, or in public. Or improper times. They're not allowed to have sex in the day, daylight, in the daytime. No more than five times a night, which makes you wonder the stamina of the ancients. Um, or also when, when one's wife was menstruating, pregnant, breastfeeding, um, or when she had taken a Day, a one-day vow of abstinence, which Buddhist women often take. And then, of course, the organ and orifice rules, right? Uh, mouth and anus are uh, prohibited. So after the third century, then, permi permissible sex is penal vaginal heterosexual intercourse with non-protected women per performed only at night, no more than five times away from religious sites. This is not at all found before the third century. So this occurs, this, um, um, we find the emergence of this more micromanagerial approach to sex beginning in the third century. Other than this, everything else is sexual misconduct. One of the things to note throughout this is that sex is presumed to be for, for pl pleasure and not for procreation. So when people say today that sex is for that according to Buddhism, only sex, the only sex that's permissible is sex that's for procreation. I at least haven't found this in any of the texts. The texts all presume that people are having recreational sex, not sex for procreation. And it, the texts don't say only sex for procreation is permitted. That isn't the case. Um, 
love or romantic attachment to someone as a precondition for sex is also not there. Um, we, we, don't, we never find you can only have sex in the context of a loving relationship. That's also missing from these texts. Um, okay, the other things I think I've mentioned. Oh, the last one. It's presumed that men will always have sexual access to their wives. So there's no notion of marital rape in this literature, which is um, um, quite different from uh, contemporary standards. The question is, why do these norms, what's special about the third century? What makes the third century so important? So um, this is around the time when the, the the Buddhist erotic or Kama Shastra literature is taking off. And I think, in a sense, this is a Buddhist response to this, that the Buddhist tradition is saying, look, the, the non-Buddhist tradition is giving men all this freedom in the area of sexuality, and now we're going to curtail it. Or it's possible that it's, that, that it's a response to the Dharma Shastra literature, that the, that the Hindu tradition at this time is also beginning to uh, regulate the activities of, uh, of lay people and that the Buddhists want to say, look, we can regulate just as effectively as you can regulate. And so this is where, this, where these uh, ideas come from. But in the end, I think it's mostly the fact that these men were scholastic monks who were trying to figure out who Buddhists should have sex with, when they should, where they should, how they should. And so in the process of asking these questions, they kind of invent these regulations. OK. So what about today? And this brings us back to the beginning of the talk and also to the end of the talk. So you know, when contemporary Buddhists think about these questions, there are two ways that, that questions like this have traditionally been um, uh, thought about. One is a literalist or traditionalist response that say, look, these norms that were elaborated in the third century are applicable today. They're as applicable today as they were back then. Um, this is the mainstream Asian Buddhist view, I think. At least in the Tibetan tradition, if you were to ask most Tibetan lamas today what constitutes sexual misconduct, they would say, like the Dalai Lama did on that day, right? They would take out the ancient text and say, this is what the classical texts say. The, the kind of skeptical modern response would be, none of this really applies. These are all ancient norms, and they should just be jettisoned, right? I mean, we're living in a very different world. None of this stuff applies. Um, and I, I think you, you, see, you see this in the Christian tradition as well. You have a kind of literalist view that the the, the norms have to be accepted at face value, and they're eternal, and they should not be interpreted. They should simply be accepted. And then you have theologians like Mary Daly, uh, who you, see, you see here carrying an ax, uh, who says these things are so misogynistic and so filled with, uh, with anti-woman sentiments that the whole thing just needs to be chucked. Right? There's, there's nothing that's redeemable here. Everything just needs to be tossed out, and we need to start from scratch. None of this is acceptable. So that's why Mary Daly has been called a separatist. And then there is a kind of middle way between these two approaches. That's the approach of Rosemary Ruther that you see on the right um, that we can call a kind of critical hermeneutic of retrieval. That is, looking at the text and trying to see First of all, what are the historical conditions that brought about, for example, a more restrictive sexual ethics? And is there anything that, that's left there that can be of value? So um, I think we can say definitively that the later tradition, that the kind of micromanagerial ap approach that tells you know, people what they can do during sex and how many times they can do it and whether they can do it during the daylight hours and so forth, First of all, that there's no early scriptural warrant for this, that this was simply made up in the third century. Secondly, that approaches like this don't really work because humans are really ingenious and they always figure out ways of circumventing rules. 
So there's no point in trying to regulate in sec sexuality in this way because it really doesn't work. And, um, and th therefore, the whole approach is not really defensible. This Gendun Chumbel, who's a famous uh, philosopher, Tibetan philosopher, who died in the 1950s, um, or 1951, I guess, uh, uh, he said, it's futile to get people to do what they don't desire and futile to force them to stop doing what they do desire. Uh, he wrote, he was one of the few writers to write uh, an er erotic text in Tibetan, a uh, work of, uh, uh, of the Kama Shastra literature. Okay, so this is where I'll end. So w what should then, what kind of norms, what kind of ethical norms should uh, be stressed? Um, what should inform, what kind of principles should inform Buddhist sexual ethics? I think things like egalitarianism, that whatever applies to men should also apply to women and vice versa. A certain amount of flexibility, realizing that, um, that, that people have different sexual proclivities, different tastes, and different life situations. I mean, how just is it to say that, that human beings can only have sex at night? Uh, if you have somebody who's working the night shift, that dooms that person to de facto celibacy, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So we have to take considerations like this into account. Uh, I think that the early norm, for example, that people should not violate uh, others' committed relationships is uh, a, good, a good one, and I think that is defensible. Um, and uh, that sex should be practiced responsibly so as to minimize harm. And I'm he thinking here of kind of safer sexual practices. I think that Buddhists can affirm that sex is for pleasure while also being committed to lessening attachment as part of sexual relationships. And that, se and that sexual relationships should enhance broader Buddhist values. Like what? There, there, there is a section from one of the very old texts that said that a married couple once went in front of the Buddha and asked them, how can we remain together, not only in this life, but in future lives as well. And this is what the Buddha said. If two spouses want to see each other, not only in this life, but also in the life to come, they should have the same level of faith, the same level of commitment to ethics, the same level of generosity, and the same level of wisdom. That is how they see each other, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. So the Buddha is saying, um, in this passage, he's saying, if you want to be together, throughout all your lives, then what, what you should do is uh, commit jointly to the broader values that, that, I, that I have taught, things like generosity and wisdom. Okay, on that I will stop and I'm open to your questions. Thank you. And I, I know that I've gone a little bit, maybe a lot, over time. So if any of you need to leave, just please do so. That's quite all right. Otherwise, just ask away if there's any questions. Oh, yes. The uh, thing about what are the norms like was... Um, Second to that one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's, yeah, this... Is this now your moral account, mm -hmm. or did you... Like, this is mine, this is mine. So it's just your idea? My idea, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so one of, the you one, one of the hats that I wear is as, a, is as a Buddhist theologian. So having done the kind of historical work, at this point I'm reflecting as an insider to the tradition as to what, what the norms of, what sexual ethical norms should be like in the Buddhist tradition, and what principles should inform. follow up on that, so the Dalai Lama suggesting there be more research, more research has been done now, has he come up with his own recommendation? No, I just gave him a copy of my book about uh, a month, two months ago, so I don't know, I don't know what, what will happen at this point, actually, um, and I don't even know actually what what form that conversation, that broader conversation would take, whether members of the 
monastic community would come together with lay people and how broad that should be. So, um, or whether communities, individual communities would decide that this is the, the norms within our community. But um, that has yet to happen. Do you think it will, you think it will happen in this Dalai Lama's lifetime? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a really huge issue because most communities in the West where this is an issue tend to be inclusive, which means that they haven't really discriminated against GLBT people. Um, um, until that happens, I mean, if, if that were to happen, then I think it would become more of an issue. It is beginning to happen. I mean, it is happening to a certain extent in Southeast Asia. Um, but throughout a lot of Southeast Asia, there's also a lot of acceptance of queer people. So, so I, I don't know that it's as central an issue to the Buddhist tradition. Um, but theologically, I mean, there are, there are problems. And um, I think it would be good to get resolution on this, which is one of the reasons why I do all this research. Darren? Uh, I just can ask her. Do you have a follow-up question? Uh, Did you? Do you want to ask your follow-up? Um, yeah, so when you're, thanks, uh, when you're speaking about this, my understanding is what you're speaking to is the lay community. And uh, it seems to me that we're biggest issues is within the monastic community, particularly uh, people, teachers in power, and uh, folks who are studying with them, uh, in the way their interaction with the, the community. Is that? That's not mentioned in these texts. It's not mentioned in these texts because Monks and nuns in these texts were presumed to be celibate uh -huh. and, and not, not to be having sex with anybody, much less their students, right? But you're right that this has become a huge issue in, in the West today. That um, The issue is not so much really homosexuality versus heterosexuality, but the fact that, uh, that people in positions of power, teachers, Buddhist teachers, uh, oftentimes... Uh, have sexual relations with their students. And we haven't even looked at, you know, it's not only their students, but, you know, we take human beings to be as they are in any religious tradition. You know, what are the, nobody mentions, except for, you did talk about women who were protected. Uh, I'm thinking about children. Yeah, that's also been an issue, actually. It's It's been an issue in monasteries where, Monasteries in Buddhist monasteries, uh, children are, can be ordained as as young as seven years old, and actually they're probably children as young as five years old in monasteries, and there have been uh, reported cases of child abuse within monasteries. So there have been a number of responses to this in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, an eminent Western scholar of. Um, an eminent uh, Sri Lankan scholar of Theravada Buddhism has suggested that there should be no novice ordinations below age, I can't remember what he said, age 16 or something. And if, when you're speaking to that, though, uh, I could be completely wrong here, but we're speaking mostly about male monastic That's right. And we're not seeing that in just like in any other yeah. culture, we're not really seeing that among Yeah. I mean, you, you do find, uh, in the ancient texts, you find lesbian relationships, at least lesbian sexual encounters described in the, in the ancient texts, but they don't count. They, in the end, they end up not counting. Yeah. So. Um, There's a lot here to be addressed. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you to comment a little bit more on the third point there, uh, the relationship between affirming the pleasure of sex while being committed to lessening attachment. And this 
a similar, I was thinking about something similarly when you were mentioning the seed metaphor yeah. and how uh, you said something to the extent of a somebody who doesn't have these mental seeds anymore, this kind of ideal advanced practitioner would experience pleasure but not desire from that. Or would it, sorry, they wouldn't experience desire, but I wonder if, they, if the texts are clear about whether they would experience pleasure or not. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, and how would that impact what you consider to be this sort of goal of affirming pleasure versus, and, and while, while also recognizing the issue of attachment and addiction and so forth? Yeah. So I'm not sure that I've worked out those, all those questions, but um, there's a famous passage in which the Buddha says that because he has eliminated desire, he has also eliminated pleasure. So he says, there, I can't remember who his interlocutor is, he says, there is a way, X, that my interlocutor, uh, that, that the Tagata can be said not to experience pleasure. Um, so that's a kind of subtle theological point, but um, I suppose the question is, if you minimize attachment, is it possible to still have a kind of pleasurable sexual relationship? And I don't know the answer to that. I would think that there are some models of relationship in which attachment could be minimized and still yet be fulfilling physically and emotionally. And what that looks like, I don't know. I once thought that marriage might be that. Uh, um, that marriage kind of brings about a kind of waning of in the intensity of uh, sexual uh, romantic attachment. But then I actually looked at some study online that said that married people have more sex than people who aren't married, so that kind of blew that theory out of the water. So I really don't know what the answer to that question is. Yes? I have two um, related questions. Anyway, when you say the first one, I might not even go to the second one. Okay. Well, I'll just say both. Um, so is the, the doctrine of Anatta, the no-self, is that prevalent in some Tibetan Buddhist traditions? And if so, is that does that give a Buddhist theologian some kind of resources for challenging, um, kind of essentializing um, gender and sexuality? That is, if, if one isn't to be attached to identity aspects of the self, then does that give a Buddhist theologian who cares to some, some leverage on challenging some of these prohibitions in terms of, say, homosexual sexuality? Um, I think it does give one, and in fact we find this also in the text themselves, which, where uh, norms of like masculinity or femininity are challenged from that vantage point of the notion of non-self or emptiness. So we find that in the text themselves. I mean, it's not as if we have to interpret our way to that position, it's actually found in the text. Um, and yet, when it comes to ethics, it's as if all of that kind of gets thrown out the window, and then the norms become quite rigid. Um, but what I mean, what the case? Part of the case that I was trying to make is that these more rigid norms come about due to specific historical conditions in the third century, and they're not found in the early tradition. So they're kind of a historical construction. So people who want to be you know, real literalists, they want to say, no, I want to believe in every aspect of this tradition, you know, uh, whatever it says, then they also have to recognize the fact that what the tradition says in this most uh, micromanagerial form, in, in the strictest form, isn't found until the third century. Now, if they want to be true literalists, then why not be literalists in regard to the earlier norms, which are much more elegant, and simply say, don't violate other people's committed relationships. That's, those are the earliest norms. Right? Yeah. Uh, kind of a two-part question, but yeah. after it's easy. Uh, so uh, going back to at the beginning where you talked about this anecdote of the Dalai Lama and he pulls out um, Tonkapa's uh, Lam Lamrim stages of the past. Yeah. Um, so since that isn't like a 
It's not a sutra, for example, that's based. It's a sort of compilation, it's a compilation. album of all the greatest yeah. hits of, of yeah. stuff, so yeah. to say. Um, so were the, was the text to, to, to create that prescript of there are certain times, certain yeah. places, certain orifices? He, he looked at works that were written after the third century. Okay. Um, and then, so just clarifying, I guess, um, by, when you say texts written after the third century, what class of texts do you mean? Because I don't think you mean, my, the impression that I got was, um, so was it sutras we were talking about? They're not sutras, they're, they're scholastic treatises. Okay. Yeah. But it's not as though, even though they don't have the status of scripture, being the word of the Buddha, these texts came to have incredible authority in both Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, to the point where I would say they probably had as much authority as the word of the Buddha or the scriptures. Um, because the, the people who wrote them were the greats of, you know, of uh, Buddhism, both in India, and then they were adopted in Tibet. So they had tremendous authority. And they continue to have authority. I mean, Tsongkhapa, when he, when he elaborated the doctrine, he didn't look to the sutras, he looked to these scholastic treatises. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so my question was about the meditation on corpses. Yes. Um, that was pres specifically prescribed for developing sexual restraint. Yes. And um, I was kind of surprised by that because in yoga it's prescribed to understand that this is compost and to not be attached to your notion of self. So could you shed some light on that, or is it just a divergence I mean, of the I tradition? In Buddhism, it's both. It's a recognition, I mean, it's uh, it's said to be recognizing the true nature of the body, which is not the, the kind of pleasant, clean, good-smelling thing that we normally take it to be, but rather uh, something that is disgusting by nature. Uh, and that, that, that is the true nature of the body. So on the one hand, there's that, but it's supposed to be a very effective antidote to sexual desire. In other words, a person who has that conception of their own body and somebody else's body isn't going to want to be doing a lot of bump and grind. You know, I mean, that's kind of the theory. <laughs> you, can, you guys can decide. Yeah. Can you look for a model of relationship that affirms pleasure of sex and also was committed to lessening attachment, where would you look? Well, like I said, I thought marriage was that. <laughs> <laughs> or any form of like kind of long-term committed relationship because I thought, I thought to myself that um, attachment and desire kind of become more mellow, let's put it that way, over time. And that therefore, this could be a way of affirming, I mean, being in a committed relationship could be a way of affirming one's identity as a sexual being and affirming the existence of pleasure and the importance of pleasure in one's life, while at the same time trying to attenuate desire. Um, but I'm not sure that this is true because as I, as I mentioned, it turns out that people who are in long-term committed relationships, I think, actually end up having more sex than people who aren't. So. And then with that knowledge, if you were going to love the um, So I don't know. I don't know that I have more answers to that. I mean, I, I suppose, for example, I mean, you, you can imagine all sorts of creative things. You can imagine, for example, a good Buddhist couple deci deciding that. Um, that they're only going to have sex once a week or twice a week um, as a way of kind of curtailing the amount of uh, attachment, sexual attachment in their relationship. I mean, I throw this out as an example. I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying that there's different ways that people might regulate their sexual lives in order to lessen attachment. I don't know if, if that would work because, you know, if you're only having sex once a week, then if, you know, depending on what <laughs> what your sexual life used to be like, it could be that that you end up having it four times on the day that you do have it, in which case you're not really lessening attachment, right? 
So, I mean, I don't know that I have answers to any of these questions, but I can imagine people creating their own individual sexual ethics within a context of committed relationships or not, you know, or, or not committed relationships, yeah. I'm challenged by the claim that uh, desire is just a mental state, um, because when I, when I think of times that I've desired things, whether it be food or physically attracted to somebody, I, it's an embodied experience, right? So I feel it in my stomach, I feel it, yeah, I feel it in my stomach, whether it be a flutter because I think somebody is cute, or uh, hunger pains because I'm starving for yeah. food. Um, could it be that this claim is the way it is because of who's writing it? Um, and are there, is there sort of a philosophy of desire among lay Buddhists who are not trying to you know, cut off that desire completely so to not so as to not arouse the, the yeah, sexual there's, there's There's basically no writings by non-monks. All this literature was written by monks up until the modern period. Now, you know, in the last maybe 50 years, 40, 50 years, there have been lay Buddhists that have written texts. But other than that, you know, 2,450 years worth of Buddhist literature has been all written by monks, basically. Um, and does this does this come from, from that? I mean, from the fact that, it, that it's monastic? I'm not sure that it, it comes from the fact that it's written by celibate monks, this idea that, that desire is only a mental state. Really, I think it's driven by the fact that they want to say that there are people who are embodied and yet have no desire. So if... Um, desire were intimately linked to the body, then it should occur in everyone who's embodied. And the Buddhist tradition wants to say, look, there are people who have bodies that have no desire. And as long as that's the case, that means that it isn't necessarily linked to the body, that somehow it's a mental thing that we can get rid of. Could it be that just these people who have no desire have mastered Yeah, I mean, how desire actually gets exterminated for good, that's a really complicated process. But um, there are ways, and it, it's not simply a question of will. It's actually a, 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 an issue of wisdom is, in the end, what's supposed to put an end to it. I think um, we're really uh, running short of time. Um, if you have more specific questions, please come forward and, and ask them. Uh, directly of Professor Cabazon, and please join me in thanking Dr. Cabazon for the wonderful